As you saw, uh, we had an awesome and uh, <clears throat> successful week of Falls Creek, and uh, I think it just means so much more since we weren't able to, to go last year, and I know it means a lot for the kids as well, um, but in the midst of all the fun and all the activities, um, at the very end of the video, um, those kids that stood up and spoke were kids that made a decision, um, whether it's uh, uh, salvation, recommitment, or, um, or dedicating their lives to the ministry. Uh, and, and so if you have a chance um, after service, um, no, no, praise God, yeah, right? Uh, if you have a chance, please, uh, if you see them, uh, congratulate them, um, because it, it is a big deal. Um, today we're going to be in the book of Matthew, chapter 21. So I said this in, a, in the first service as well, and it hasn't gone away. Um, I always get nervous uh, with public speaking, and if you, if you know me very well, you know that's very strange considering um, what kind of a person I am. Um, but, but I think it's, um, it's God uh, that, that allows me to feel this way because he wants to remind me that um, it's not about how eloquently I speak. It's not about how well I articulate. It's not the words I choose. Um, but rather, it's him speaking through me. Um, and, and so, let's, uh, let's all uh, stand and, uh, and read the word of God along together. We're going to be in verses 18 through 22, all right? So, in the morning, as he was returning to the city, he became hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but only leaves. And he said to it, may no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. When the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither at once? 
And Jesus answered them, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Um, so one of the, uh, oh, go ahead and be seated. Sorry, I always forget. Um, one, one of my favorite things uh, at Falls Creek is, um, is all these salvations, all, the, all these kids that come to know Jesus um, through that experience. Um, and, and it got me thinking here, and every plant, right, whether it's the mightiest oak or the uh, smallest herb starts as a seed. Um, and, and so this, this passage actually took me back a few chapters to, to Matthew chapter 13 in, in the parable of the sower. And, and so in the parable of the sower, he, he talks about um, the seeds that fall by the, uh, by the path, the beaten path, and, and they're eaten up um, by, the, uh, by the animals of the world before it actually takes root. Um, but what I want to focus on are, are people, um, are the seeds that actually manage to take root um, and sprout. And so if we look at the, uh, the second um, example in the parable he gave us, um, he gives us uh, the seeds that fell um, into the rocks. And, and so because of the rocks, um, there, there was a shallow uh, embedding of the seed. The seed fell in shallow soil. And so uh, it grew quickly, but it also withered at the first sign uh, of trial and tribulation. And, and what that led me to was it's not about where the seed was planted, so much as how shallow it was. And this is the shallow understanding of the word of God um, that's given to us in this example. You see, because people who hear the good news of God, who, who taste uh, and see that he is good, very often stop there. They don't allow the word of God to truly embed itself into their very being, into their spirit, and so while they have heard the gospel, while they have heard the good news, they don't understand exactly what that entails. And so as soon as they get back from camp, they're back to their old ways. As soon as they get back from a retreat, as soon as they get out of church on a Sunday morning, they're back to their old ways. In, uh, in Acts chapter 17, um, Paul writes, uh, sorry, not Paul, Luke writes, um, in verses 10 through 12, um, the brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas uh, away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them therefore believed with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. You see, they, they were different from... Um, the church in Thessalonica. They were different from the people in Thessalonica because they were willing to spend time and compare what they heard with God's word. You see, and that's something that we need to be doing on the daily. When you hear something at church from the pastor, Sunday school teacher, whatever it may be, it is your duty and obligation to check and make sure that it is biblically correct before you start uh, using it for your daily walk. When the, the world, when people of the world tell you things, you need to cross-reference that with the scripture. You see, because they were comparing, they knew not only what was wrong, they knew what was right. Because you need to know what's right before you know exactly what's wrong. And so that's why they, they were so willing to accept the word of God, and they were so willing to learn, and their numbers grew. And it's the same thing that we have to apply in our daily walk. So the second one is uh, the, uh, the seed thrown in, uh, amongst thorns. Right? And, and the thorns represent um, a love of the world. You see, if we turn to uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, it says this, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, let me get a little more in-depth into that. We're going to go about three chapters forward in John, uh, 1 John chapter 4, uh, verses 15 and 16. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe that the love that God has for us, God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. So 
taking these two verses, we see that if you love the world, the love of the Father, the love of God is not within you. But if you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, as your Savior, the Father is within you, and the, and the love of the Father is in you because God is love. You see, so these two ideas are incompatible. And the love of the world isn't just things like money or possessions. The love of the world is anything that sets, you, uh, that sets God below anything else in your life. You see, because the Spirit of God dwells within us, and once you, re, uh, once you are saved, once you have Jesus in your life as your Lord and Savior, we go through a, a long and arduous process called sanctification, which simply means that our spirit aligns with God's. And it's a lifelong process that won't be complete until we are reunited uh, with the Father in glorification. You see, but... When our desires start lining up with God, in order for that to happen, we have to first love the things that God loves, or rather love the people that God loves. Because we don't get to choose who, who, who God loves and, in turn, who we give God's love to. Because we love since, uh, because he first loved us. In Matthew chapter 22, um, Jesus is asked, uh, what is the greatest commandment? And he said, love the, love the Lord God, your Father, right? With all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. Um, and the second one is, is love your neighbors. And it's in that order. And so anything you put above those two things is the love of the world. If you prioritize your children, if you prioritize your family above God, that is the love of the world. All these things that are good when in the appropriate priority uh, location in our lives is bad once it usurps the position of God. And so that's why so many people fall prey to these thorns. So based on this parable, um, we, can, we can liken uh, our salvation experience to a, a seed sprouting. You see, because if the seed doesn't sprout, then nothing happens, right? It's eaten up by, by the beasts of the earth. But in these three scenarios that he's given to us, past the path, um, it, it shows us that the seed is implanted and it has sprouted. And so it's not just a simple matter of, oh, they were never saved or they were saved. It's a matter of what you do after that initial decision, And so all these three, uh, the, the, the three examples that are given to us are, are the types of soil that that seed fell into. And, um, and I'm not much of a gardener, but I do know uh, a little bit about it. Because I know that good fruit cannot come from bad soil. In Galatians chapter 5, um, Paul writes uh, about uh, the... the uh, the results of worldliness and the fruit of the Spirit, right? So if you want to turn with me to Galatians chapter 5, we're going to read quickly uh, through uh, Philippians. Um, I mean, not Philippians, sorry. Verses 16 uh, through 24. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Uh, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For those are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. So we just, ref we just confirmed what we just read in 1 John. The love of the Father and the love of the world are incompatible. They are complete opposites. The desires of the flesh and the desires of the Spirit are complete opposites. They are incompatible. Um, verse 19, now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul is not writing to unbelievers here. He is writing to people who are a part of the church, who have accepted Jesus Christ. And just in case he gets that one guy who writes back and says, uh, Paul, I know you said all these things are bad, but what about this? 
Surely this one can't be bad in moderation. That's why I put all these things, right? Things like these. Every sin, everything that goes against the will of God, every byproduct of a sinful life is listed as an example here. If sin is evident and rampant in your life, there will be some evidence of it that's going to come out in, in the forms that he just listed. But on the other side of that, verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. When Paul listed out these things, he didn't say fruits of the Spirit, right? All nine of these things are one fruit. You see, as, as Christ followers, as people who have been saved by Christ, who have been redeemed by Christ, and who has the Spirit of God inside of them, we should be bearing all parts of this fruit, not just the parts that are easy. For some of us, it might be easy to be patient. For others, it might be difficult. But these are all listed on there because every single aspect of your life should change. Paul writes that we are a new creation. The old is gone, and behold, a new has come. And so to see what kind of soil you've created for your seed, what kind of environment you've created for your heart, you have to examine what kind of fruit you're bearing. If these things are not evident in your life, if you are not growing in your life, in your walk with God, there's something wrong. Uh, if we look back at our title verse here, title passage here, we got Matthew chapter 21, verse 19. Jesus, uh, Jesus commands the tree to no longer bear fruit and wither. And, and this was a passage that stumped me every time I read it. Until God gave me that little aha moment. Right? Because I asked myself, why would Jesus, who was so compassionate to the needy, that was so willing to heal the sick, so quick to dine with sinners, be so quick to judge this tree? It's because the tree right now is the same as those Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes who Jesus considered, considered hypocrites. You see, because this fig tree had leaves, bountiful leaves, but no fruit, it betrayed expectations. You see, because the tree is lush, the tree is green, the tree has so many leaves, you would expect it to be fruitful, and you would expect there to be something to come from it. But when Jesus got to the tree, he noticed that there was no fruit. And it, it betrayed the expectations of results. You see, because all that that fig tree was, was it had the appearance of a healthy fig tree. But none of the fruit to show for it. And that's how we are sometimes, you see. Because when we come to church, we put on this fake persona. We want to look good in front of people. We want to appear sinless. We want to appear like we're on top of life. When in reality, we're broken inside. Stop focusing on the leaves and start focusing on the fruit. So why are we not bearing fruit then? Why was this tree not bearing fruit? You see, there's multiple reasons why, and, and I'm not really a, a biologist, so I can't really tell you all the reasons. Um, but I think one of, the re, uh, one of the ways that we have to understand is, what is the purpose of fruit? You see, because we're told over and over again that as Christians, we must bear fruit. But if we look at fruit and the purpose of fruit in God's design, fruit is specifically created not to give people joy, not to give animals joy, but to spread the seed. You see, the more delicious the fruit 
The more plentiful the fruit, the more chances of a seed being planted and trees growing. And so your fruits, my fruits, are not meant for our consumption. The fruit of the Spirit is not for you to enjoy. The fruit of the Spirit is so that others may taste, see that God is good, and have that seed embedded into their hearts. And so if a fruit has no reason to spread seeds, to sow seeds, then there's no need for the fruit. If we as Christians are not following Jesus' commands, his commission, then there's no need for fruit in our lives. You see, if we're not going out and making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Spirit, teaching them what is good, If we are not doing those things, there's no need for fruit in our lives. Because who's going to taste it? There may be another thing in the way. Um, This is something that I learned when I came to Oklahoma, but uh, we have these things called bagworms. Is that right? Right? They apparently like spin nests and trees and and kill them. So that's really bad. Um, But there might be something in the way. There's something that's inhibiting that tree from getting the nutrients to the proper place, right? It could be a disease. It could be a pest. It could be whatever it is, right? For Christians, we call that sin. You see, because once we're saved, it's not like we have to not worry about sin anymore. You see, because even though that we are no longer under the law, we are still to uphold it. Because we have to understand that Christ came not to abolish the law. He didn't come to free us from all these things, but he came to fulfill it. Because the law was originally there so that man would realize how far he fell short of the glory of God. And I don't know about you guys, but I fall short every single day. And so that sin, it gets in the way of our relationship, of our communion with Jesus, with with the Father. And you start hearing him less. You start feeling his guidance less. And it becomes easier and easier. You see, the sin that that destroys relationships, that destroys, uh, that destroys churches, that destroys families, is not done overnight. It's accumulated daily, little by little. If we, learn to, if we turn to uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, he tells us, Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. You see, because if it's so easy for you to sin, if it's so easy to to continuously fall over and over again without any change or growth whatsoever, then it might be time to reevaluate who it is you're actually following. So I want to take this opportunity for for everyone to to just look inward, look at their walk with God, see where you started from, that initial salvation, and see how far you've come, if you've come anywhere at all. You see, because our, our uh, our reuniting with the Father is not the finish line, it is the starting line. That salvation you experience, the baptism, that is your first step into your journey, not your last And so see if there is fruit. Or have you been too worried about the leaves? It's not enough for us to behave like Christ followers. You see, because Christianity, our faith, is not about what we do or what we don't do. It's about what Christ did for us. You see, because Jesus tells us in the end times that these people will come to him and they will say, Lord, Lord, did we not do these great things in your name? Did we not cast out demons? Did we not heal the sick in your name? 
And he will reply, depart from me. I never knew you. But Jesus, didn't we volunteer for Sunday school and VBS and children's ministry, youth ministry, missions? Depart from me. I never knew you. But Jesus, what about all those seats I filled up at church? What about all the people I brought to you? Depart from me. I never knew you. Our relationship with Christ is not a checklist, and he's not up there with a calculator keeping tab. Maybe you're not bearing fruit because of sin in your life. If you go back a chapter, 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, chapter 2, verse 1, sorry. Um, it says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate in the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. <laughs> he is the propitiation for our sins, and not only ours, but also for the sins of the world. You see, because in Christ... We have victory over sin. And so our confession of sin is not an admission of defeat. It is a celebration of the victory that Christ Jesus gave to us when he died on the cross and resurrected. So what do we do? What do we do if, if we've been so focused on our leaves that we haven't been bearing fruit? What do we do if we've let sin run rampant in our lives so that we can't even hear the will of the Father anymore? Well, Jesus tells us in that very same chapter. Verse, 20, uh, verse 21, And Jesus answered them, Truly I say to you, if you have the faith and do not doubt, you will, only, you will not only do what has been done to this fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. You see, because it's that simple. God created us simple creatures. He gave us simple tasks. And he gave us a simple way to get back to him. If you've strayed from God's path because of sin, pray and confess. If you've been too focused on the leaves and you strayed from the path, pray and confess. If you have never had that relationship with Jesus Christ, pray and ask him to reveal himself to you. you see, because it may not be easy, but it is simple. James chapter 5, verse 16 says this. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. You see, the good news is that you don't have to do this on your own. That it's not just you and Jesus. He has surrounded you with a body of like-minded believers who care for you and love you, not because they're better people than you, but because they receive that same love that you're receiving from Christ right now. As we get into this time um, of prayer, you don't have to get out from your seat. But there is a significance to coming to the altar, you see. Because in the gospel, there are instances when Jesus makes that first move. But like the woman who was diseased for 12 years, sometimes God waits for us. So you don't have to come up here but what I do want to ask is that if, if this is something that you are experiencing, if this is something that you wished would go away, seek a brother or sister in Christ. Ask them to pray for you. It doesn't have to be now, but it does have to be soon. You see, because when we're, when we're allowing sin to infest our lives, when we're allowing God to not be the, the integral part in our lives, we're missing out on so much more. 
And our time here is so short to do what he has asked us to do, what he has called us to do. So don't waste this opportunity. Don't wait until it's too late. Remember your first love. Remember that first moment when Christ called you out of sin, called you his family, called you his children. A royal priesthood, inheritor of the kingdom of God. And if that joy is no longer in your heart, pray. Pray without ceasing. Pray with faith. 